Good morning to the Daryl Dominion. Um, we're here looking at chapter five, which is about energy. And so uh, I hope everything's going well. For those of you who need to, uh, for various reasons, go back and look at chapter six, excuse me, um, look back at the last unit, unit two, and um, do a couple more of the problems on the test to get a better score on the test, um, et cetera, uh, please contact me and let me know what's going on through email. Um, I do have the schedule for the assignments for chapter five and six, which will be the last two chapters that we'll do. Laid out, the dates could change a little bit. Uh, if possible, I would like to move those dates up rather than back. We're kind of pushing to the end of the school year with our material. Uh, now, getting back to Chapter 5 and energy, um, energy is kind of, a, kind of a hard thing to really come up with for a definition, and physicists and scientists have struggled with this for centuries. But basically, it comes down to if, if something has the ability to do work, it's energy. And so the first part of the chapter talks about what is work and so that we get understanding of what work is all about and then we can go back and study energy uh, and a couple of different types of energy in particular. But uh, work is done whenever you have a force and that force causes something to move. And then um, the equation is real simple. It's just work equals force times distance and if we look at the units, um, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And so if we're taking a kilogram meter per second squared times meters, our entire SI units, um, base units are kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, but we use Newton for force and meters for distance. So it's a Newton meter, but to shorten everything else up, uh, they have decided to name this a joule. And um, the SI unit, therefore, for work is the joule, and it's in honor of James Prescott Joule, who was a British physicist back in the 1800s. And uh, his biggest interest was in electricity, but he did a lot of work with work and energy and he's defined work in terms of electrical units instead of in terms of newtons and meters and so on. And so uh, one thing that's unique about this is he was given this honor of having a unit named after him before he died. He had retired from his professorship, etc., but he was still alive when they named the work unit in his honor. Uh, work is a vector, and remember when we've studied vectors before that if, if you're multiplying and dividing anything, and if one of the units in there is a vector, then your answer is also a vector. Well, both force and displacement are vectors, therefore work is a vector. And so you'll have work is, is done, uh, you can have positive work and negative work, and um, the work is just in reference to the direction. Um, if your force and displacement are in the same direction, you have positive work. So if you're pulling something to the right, your force is moving to the right and the object is moving to the right, that is positive work. Um, if your car is traveling down the road and you apply your brakes, the force is going backwards, but the car is moving forwards, then the brakes are doing negative work on the car. And so friction always does negative work because it always opposes motion. Now, here are some diagrams from our textbook illustrating this. So if we have, um, you need to use the force component, which is in the same direction as the motion. And so in this example here, we have a force that is going that is going in this direction. And it's this component right here that is the component that's going in the direction that the box is moving. So the component we're interested in is F cosine theta. 
And so to find the work, we're going to take this value times the distance it moves, not this value. Now you'll notice when you're carrying a bucket that uh, the hand is exerting a force in this direction. And so the hand is doing no work on the bucket itself because the um, cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So anytime the force is perpendicular to the motion, no work is being done by that force. And so you'll also notice FG, the weight is going down. So um, the force of gravity is also not doing any work on this because it's perpendicular to the motion. And one of the things that's a little bit uh, difficult for people to um, grasp is when is gravity doing positive work and when is gravity doing negative work? Well, it's real simple if you remember that um, when the force and the displacement are in opposite directions, it's negative. And when they're in the same direction, it's positive. So gravity is doing positive work whenever the object is moving down. It's doing negative work gravity is doing negative work whenever the object is being lifted. So in this case here, um, this person lifted this box from the floor up to this height. So he's doing, um, his force is doing positive work because his force is in the same direction that the box is moving. And then gravity, the gravitational force is in the opposite direction. So it's doing negative work on the box. Now, when he lets go of the box and the box drops back down to the floor, then gravity is doing positive work because gravity and the box are, are both going in the same direction. So this is just a summary of, of what I have here. So when lifting something, gravity is doing negative work because it's in the opposite direction. When something is falling, gravity is doing positive work because the motion and the force of gravity are in the same direction. And so um, if we look at our equation from before, we had work equals force times distance. We're going to add in cosine theta because we want the force that's in the same direction as the displacement. So we have this example here. When is force doing positive work, when is force doing negative work, when is force doing no work, etc. And when are we having the most work done by the force? And so in this case here, if, uh, if you have a force that's going upwards, this would be like a normal force uh, acting upward, and the direction is in this direction, this force is doing no work in, in A. In B, Again, the magnitude of the force is the same and the displacement is the same. So we have um, negative work. Here we have positive work. These two values for work will be equal, but this one will be negative and this one will be positive. So let's say someone was pulling with this force, which was equal and opposite to the frictional force. So the box continued to move with a constant velocity. The net work would be zero the negative work done by friction would be equal to the positive work done by the person. And so again, if a person pulls in this direction with the same force as gravity, excuse me, friction pulls in this direction, the box continues with the same speed along the floor. So it has a constant velocity. Um, and the work done by the pulling force is equal and opposite to the work done by the frictional force. And so the network is zero. And here we have a force that's acting at an angle going in this direction. Its work will be negative, but its work will be smaller than this work was here because the uh, cosine F will be a smaller value. And so you'll have less work being done by that force. So you should be able to 
describe whether something is doing positive or negative work based upon the direction of the force and the direction of the motion. So let's do a sample problem here. We have, again, this is right from the textbook. So the problem is an Eskimo is returning from a successful fishing trip, pulls a sled loaded with salmon. The mass of the sled and salmon is 50 kilograms and the Eskimo exerts a force of 120 newtons on the sled by pulling on the rope. So we're going to solve A here, and A says how much work does he do on the sled if the rope is horizontal to the ground? In other words, theta is zero. Well, the cosine of zero is one. And so that's like it's not in the equation. And he pulls the sled five meters. And so this is a rather simple problem to solve. Um, we have theta is zero, x is five. The Eskimo is pulling with 120 newtons, and the mass is 50 kilograms. Now, we don't even have to worry about the mass in this case. All we have to worry about is the force and the distance. Now, I left cosine theta in here just to illustrate that um, cosine theta is always there. It's just that when the force is parallel to the direction or the displacement, then you have cosine zero, which is one. So it becomes 120 times five times one, which gives us 600 joules. Well, the next part of the question is, what if the Eskimo is pulling at an angle here? And so we put the angle in. So the Eskimo is still pulling with 120 Newtons, but now the force has an angle of 30 degrees. And we're not gonna worry about friction whatever on part B, we're just going to be looking at how much work does he do when he pulls at an angle of 120. So for part B, the only thing that changes is, is we put in the 30 degrees now. So we have the Eskimo is still pulling with 120, 120 Newtons, and it's still going five meters, but now he's pulling at 30 degrees. And so you'll see that the work goes down to 520 joules. And part C, Part C asks, what if um, at the coordinate position of 12.4, the Eskimo lets up on the applied force. A frictional force of 45 Newtons between the ice and the sled brings the sled to rest at a coordinate position of 18.2 Newtons. And so now the Eskimo stops pulling. The sled has the frictional force, which slows it down and brings it to a slot, uh, stop. And so the frictional force will be parallel to the motion. And so we still have force times displacement times cosine theta, but I didn't write it in this time. Um, and I usually won't when um, the angle is zero degrees. So we have friction negative 45 because it's in the opposite direction of the motion. And then displacement, its final position was 18.2 minus its initial position, which was 12.4. Uh, so we have a negative 45 times this distance difference, which gives us a negative 260 newtons. And again, notice it's a negative sign because the force, friction, and the displacement are in opposite directions. Okay, then I'm going to go on to example 5.2, which is still working on the same problem, 5.1. But now we're going to put friction in there, and the friction is 0.2. And so the Eskimo pulls the sled 5 meters, exerting a force of 120 newtons. So the numbers stay the same. Uh, find the work done by the sled by friction and the network. And so the first part of the question is to ask... Um, asks us to solve for the work done by friction. And so we need to calculate what friction is. And friction, remember, is mu k times normal. So it'll be mu k times the mass of the sled and the fish, so this is where the mass comes in, times uh, acceleration due to gravity. So we have 0.2 
times 50 kilograms times 9.8, which gives us a negative 98 newtons. So the frictional force is a negative 98. So then to find the work done by friction, we take the frictional force, a negative 98, times the displacement, 5. And for some reason, I put in cosine 0 again. Uh, we end up with a negative 490 joules. Well, if you remember from when we solved the problem in 5.1, we had a work of 600 joules. Now, there are other forces there. You have the normal force, but the normal force is perpendicular to displacement, so that work is zero. And you have the weight of the fish and the sled, but that is also perpendicular to the motion, and so that work is zero. If we were on a hill, these two um, would factor in, and you would have to figure out how much work was done by the uh, component of the normal force that uh, was acting on the, on the incline and the same thing for the gravity. But in this case, these are both zero. So we just take 600, the force that we figured out, the work that we figured out in 5.1, plus the negative 490 joules that was the frictional work, and we end up with 110 joules. Then for part B, it's the same problem again uh, with the Eskimo pulling the sled. The Eskimo is still pulling with 120 newtons, uh, but now it's at 30 degrees, just like it was in 5.1, but we're going to include friction. Now, the thing you have to remember is if we were pulling at an angle of 30 degrees, we have a Y component to the Eskimo's force. And that Y component plus the normal force is going to be equal to the weight of the sled. So the Y component of the Eskimo's force would be 120 sine 30, which is 60 newtons. And so now the normal force is going to be reduced by 60 newtons. So then um, here we have the equation that I just mentioned before, weight will equal normal force plus the Y component. And so then rewriting this for the normal force, we get weight minus the uh, Y component to the Eskimo's force. And we end up with um, 50 kilograms times 9.8 minus the 60 Newtons. And we end up with 430 Newtons. So now the frictional force is 430 Newtons. Um, excuse me, the um, normal force is. And remember, friction equals mu times normal force. So we take mu 0.2 times the normal force, uh, 430, and we end up with a frictional force of a negative 86 newtons. So then when we find our work net, um, this part here is the same. It's 120 times 5 times cosine theta, cosine 30, plus the frictional force, negative 86 times 5. And when we put those numbers in, we end up with 89 joules. So this gets us through chapter 5, section 1. You'll notice on the calendar that I have assignments uh, 5.1 and 5.2 combined. So I'll give you another lesson on section 5.2 later. But for now, you should be able to get started on section 5.1.